As I critically reviewed the activities of the Jewish people throughout long periods of history, I became anxious and asked myself whether for some inscrutable reasons beyond the comprehension of poor mortals such as ourselves, destiny may not have irrevocably decreed that the final victory must go to this small nation. Should the Jew, with, his, with the aid of his Marxist creed, triumph over the people of this world, his crown will be the funeral wreath of mankind. That was Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Even now, as I study the activities of white people throughout recorded history, did I yield to oppressive thoughts and am I still filled with profound anxieties? As I critically interrogated activities of white people, I asked myself if, for reasons I could not fathom, fate may have demanded that a final victory would be bestowed upon this relatively small group of underpigmented yet supremacist and colonialist people. Should the whites and their co-constituted doctrines of white privilege continue to be accepted as foundational and apodictic, they would lead to the cementing of economic and social order and the erasure, the erasure of personal and racial sovereignty. Whiteness, then, must be disrupted, for should whiteness, with the aid of supremacist doctrines, triumph over the people of this world, its crown will be the funeral wreath of mankind. That was me. I translated Mein Kampf in a paper for a feminist gender studies journal. And so what happens if that lands? <laughs> if that lands? Well, I don't know how, you know, all these people run around saying everybody is Hitler. There's been Hitler creep, you know, concept creep. Hitler, everybody's Hitler. Everything. You don't agree with me, you're Hitler. Everybody's Hitler. If this lands, people will be put in a very, very awkward position of defending Hitler. interested to pick your brain i think there's one thing that you've said a couple of times has become more clear to me over the the course of um the research i've been doing you've said this a couple of times i hope I, I don't i don't butcher it but it's it's that abstract philosophical concepts when put in practice can have life and death consequences hmm. and so i just wonder if you could could elaborate on that because my goal here is to do absorb vast amounts of information and then somehow illuminate that for the public um, right. for as many sure. people as humanly possible. Right. And there is a clear divide and it's, it's very, very difficult to bridge this gap where you speak to everyday people um, who, who don't have academic background, who, who don't actually even know much about what's going on sure. in academia. Sure. And it yeah. feels, it feels to them as though this is this, I mean, strange, obscure thing that's happening over in the corner of, of, of culture, of, of where they live. Yeah. But to me, the more I look into this, it's like there's distribution. The uh, people that make the templates for thought, they end, they end up having um, huge consequences for culture, for, for business, for everything. So I was wondering if you could, could elaborate on that thought. Yeah, that's a good introduction. Yeah, thanks for that. So, you know, one analogy is to think about uh, you know, starting with theoretical physics and you can start talking to theoretical physicists and they come up with all these strange mind bending things and so on. But uh, as we have developed science, we know the theoretical conclusions uh, then get to applied physics and then mm. the engineers do things with things and then the technologists do stuff. And then finally the entrepreneurs are creating products that make a huge difference. Now, we all then are the end users of the technology and we can appreciate it. And to some extent, it seems like magic what's going on mm. inside the technology, but it really is that abstract theoretical physics made, made uh, tangible. So the same thing holds for abstract philosophy. So there are all sorts of technical issues in metaphysics and epistemology and philosophy, of course, has a reputation for being weird. <laughs> which is because you know 90% of it is weird yes 
the, those uh, abstract principles. We are smart beings. We think in terms of generalities and we make big term plans and commitments. So to the extent that we get our general principles wrong, by the time we put them into practice, it, uh, it makes a, a huge difference. So, you know, you might then say, you know, in, in technical ethics, there's a difference between, uh, you know, deontological and consequentialist ethics. And those are big multisyllabic words. And initially it's off-putting. And what does that mean? Uh, you know, but one of the rubber meets the roads issues is going to be, you know, do you project, say, your life's happiness as your ultimate goal? And that's already to translate an abstract concept into something more particular. Now, thinking about your ultimate life's goal and what happiness means, that's all still pretty abstract. But already by thinking in that territory, you're thinking very differently than someone who says, no, my life is not really about happiness. Rather, it's about a set of duties or obligations that I am born into. And my life should be about doing what is expected of me and fulfilling my duties. Now that's then to take you know, a kind of consequentialism and a kind of deontology as we the philosophers would talk about it, but to operationalize it. And how a, you know, a young person makes a decision. You know, I, you know, I sometimes think of you know, a young woman who's say 18 or 19 years old and she has some ambitions. She wants to go to university and get a degree, maybe start a business and she wants to have a family but uh, she wants to have the whole package and put it all together by the time she's 30. So she's thinking consequentialist uh, Ickley, uh, and she has a long range plan. But we know that uh, you know, there are many young women in her situation who might announce that they want to go off to university and her parents will say, no, 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 you shouldn't be so selfish. Uh, you, know, you have an obligation to the family to carry on the name, we want you to get married to that nice boy down the street and start a family. And uh, that's a more important thing. You have obligations, young lady. And you know, this is uh, a rubber meets the road, life changing decision that she has to make. So to the extent that philosophers have had the, you know, what I would call the consequentialist versus deontological debate and sorted it out and one side has prevailed in the culture, uh, young women will then be making very uh, different decisions. So. One such decision, you know, certainly uh, we can take this example of young women. You know, three centuries ago, young women would not be thinking about, I'm going to go off to university and I should be able to vote by golly and start my own business and marry whom I choose. That's a revolution in thought, but behind that was a lot of hard philosophy fighting against other entrenched philosophical systems. And it wasn't until that abstract debate was won that then we saw a cultural revolution in how women start to think about their lives. So another example I would use is more overtly uh, political. Uh, you know, we're kind of familiar with the connections between Karl Marx and the, uh, the Russian Revolution. So, you know, Marx in the middle part of the 1800s is developing an abstract philosophy in an economic and political system. Uh, and his PhD was in philosophy. He, uh, you know, he had an entire philosophical system mm. within which his political economy is nested. And so the connections between very abstract philosophy and then converting a generation of intellectuals and then a generation of activists who then had an effect on hundreds of millions of people's lives, that's abstract philosophy making a, making a huge difference. We can make the same argument about the connections between John Locke and you know, the American Revolution. Uh, again, abstract philosophy, convincing a large number of intellectuals in the early part of the 1700s. And then we see the American revolutionaries, the founding fathers, they're all young activists, uh, but very well educated in the middle part of the 1700s. And then another kind of revolution occurs. Well, this, this is interesting. I like that you use the word revolution because um, what I've, I've noticed in trying to map this territory is that we're in the midst of some kind of soft revolution. Yeah, um, if I can tell you what I see, and I, I brought this up, and I think there's some truth to it. I haven't really articulated to too many people just yet, but if you take, if you take Marx, the, there's, a, there's a fundamental realization in Marx that is that power is nested in wealth, right? So all the, all the power and oppression is you, you get classes that are, that are hooked up to wealth and 
that creates the oppression. So if you believe this, this Marxist philosophy, if you believe it and you want to change the world in line with it in order to make, make a more equitable world, step one would be seize the means of economic production. So it, it's, it's, it's take, take over the means of economic production and then redistribute in order to equalize. That, that seems like the revolutionary enterprise that comes from this Marxist philosophy. So what, what I'm seeing in the stage two is, I mean, there's, there's streams into this. You've got the Frankfurt School, you've got uh, Gramsci hegemony, you've got, um, then you've got the, the mosques. The realization then becomes the power is hooked up in discourses. So it's in the way we speak about things and essentially knowledge production. Um, and so if you believe this, if you believe this and you're a revolutionary, just like people were Marxist revolutionaries, and you want to equalize the, uh, the oppression that comes from that pow that the powerful creating the way we speak about things, and then that going into culture and having all these effects, step one would be to seize the means of cultural production. And so what I'm seeing is that taking place. It would be education. It would be arts and entertainment. It would be media. Um, and it would be religion, which is strangely enough, a lot of the stuff is moving into. Um, and so it's not, it, I'm using the word soft revolution because it's not guns and bombs. It's PhDs and passive aggression. That's their weapon. And so what I'm seeing here is this, this soft, passive aggressive um it's it's almost a takeover i don't want to speak too um emotionally about it but they're, they're pretty explicit it, when, yeah. when you go and read this stuff they're explicit that, they're, that this is some kind of revolution but that, that's the realization and that's the kind of broad meme version of what i think is going on mm -hmm. um what do you think about that do you, do you have have some thoughts on that no no that's a very good analysis uh, yeah, clearly it is a soft revolution. When you talk about uh, the soup or the stew of all of the movements that are going on in the middle part of the 20th century, you know, critical theory and uh, hegemony analysis in Frankfurt School and the early postmodernists and so on, um, you know, out of that, there is uh, a somewhat pessimistic conclusion reached by most people in that movement that the corridors of power political and economic have been closed off to them in the, the liberal democratic capitalist West. So they don't think they're going to be able to achieve their ends through the business world. Uh, they think that that is a lost cause from their perspective or from the political world, they think that is corrupted as well. Uh, a significant number of them in the 1960s did turn to overt uh, terrorism. So it's fascinating in the 1960s how many uh, leftist organizations, the Montaneros, Bader Meinhof, yeah, Red yeah, yeah. Faction, and so on, all of them by uh, uh, very well educated, well read young people who said, you know, enough of democracy, enough of capitalism, enough mm. of liberalism, we need to take it through the streets. Their aim was to resist fascism where their parents had failed. They were known as the Red Army Faction. Dieser Staat hat, wie Sie es nannten, eine faschistische Fresse die nur mit einer Maske verhüllt ist. Und Sie haben, das war Ihre Theorie, wenn man den, den, äh, den verschleierten Faschismus zeigen will, muss man ihnen nur die, die Maske vom Gesicht reißen. Und das geht nur, indem man sie angreift. Yeah, but to fit with your thesis, those people in the 1960s, they were extraordinarily active. Mm. But by the time of the early 1970s came along, all those terrorist organizations had been defeated and shut down. So if you are then a far left strategist, sympathetic to Marxism, you know, we can't just wait around for somehow the collective consciousness to arise in the proletariat and the revolution is going to come. We need to do something, but we're not going to do it through business. We're not going to do it through democratic Republican politics. We can't do it through terrorism anymore. Well, what is left to us? It is going to be the softer cultural centers. And that's where your thesis comes in. And this is quite explicit in thinkers like Marcuse in the 60s and Jean-Francois Lyotard. They say, we have to stop 
thinking of ourselves as positioned outside the system and that we're going to, in some sense, uh, wait for the revolution to develop or force a revolution on the system from the outside. We need to get inside the system in especially education and higher education and what came to be called the long march through the institution. So we will train the teachers, we will train the journalists, we will train the artists uh, and so forth. And so it does, does become a cultural movement instead of a, a bomb throwing movement or an overtly political oh, movement. Yeah, bombs, bombs and guns. Yeah. So this is, this is the, I, f I started feeling a lot of passive aggression and this is the way things have to be within the arts and entertainment world here in Australia. And so it, it was very unsettling to me what was going on. Um, many experiences. And that's kind of what had made me head down this path. It was like, there's some, there's some kind of sociological shift here. I don't, I don't think this is just people creating art. There's something, there's something else going on here. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, the, it's hard because if you spoke to these people face to face, they wouldn't even understand what the hell you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, culture is downstream from the academy was is what i i kind of stumbled upon i guess is i followed the language and the concepts and ended up in the academy and so uh, once i got the host Pro hoax project there was a, a, a an observation that of how much of this this revolutionary postmodern um stuff is in pedagogy um which is just a fancy word for uh the theory of education, I guess, the philosophy of education. Absolutely, and yeah. so you've got, you've got Henry Giroux, you've got Bell Hooks, you've got all the people. It's very pa uh, Paulo Freire. It's very him. He's, he's got the Marxist side and then it's kind of inter intertwined with, um, with, with postmodernism through, through all these other people. Yeah, and so all you, the right names to mention, by the way, yes. I worked with Paulo Freire for about 15 years. And during that time, we did the almost impossible. We started a series called in Education and Cultural Studies through which we got about 100 people tenure. And we saw that as, a, as, a, as, as an important kind of political intervention, sort of bringing people together in ways that suggested a kind of solidarity that went beyond simply getting them jobs, getting them, in, putting them in positions where they could actually make a difference in the world in which they found themselves. I want to argue that we need to think about what it means to create a formative culture that actually provides a language that links the notions of critique to traditions of the past, historical memory, public memory, with the need to revitalize a sense of individual and collective agency. One that's tied in some fundamental way to the gap between what is and what ought to be. That great sort of tension that has mobilized revolutions all over the world, mobilized institutions, allowed people to think otherwise in order to act otherwise. Something is happening in the world today that's very encouraging. And what's happening is that people are recognizing that nothing is going to change simply by allowing yourself to get trapped in single issue issues. Don't get me wrong, single issues matter. Indigenous issues matter. Racism matters. Labor exploitation matters. But they've got to be brought together. We need a more comprehensive politics that links these things in ways that will be able to mobilize people into larger social formations. And we need to imagine not just simply reforming a society that's broken, we need to imagine eliminating it. We need a new kind of society. We need a new discourse, we need a new set of institutions. And maybe the place to begin to do that is to take seriously what it means to take education seriously, what it means to take pedagogy seriously what it means to recognize that we're not just altering knowledge, we're altering consciousness, and we're creating new kinds of subjectivities. On pedagogy, yeah, let me plug, I just this past year published uh, a piece called Liber uh, Liberal Education and its Postmodern Critics. And so it's exactly focused on the philosophy of education battles between uh, those who have various forms of postmodernism uh, and what is now the standard modern liberal arts education ideal. So if you think of liberal education, which uh, is a relative newcomer in the history of education, several centuries old now, but it's something that arose in the context of the modern world. You start to think of people as individuals, not as members of a, of a feudal class. And so what kind of education is appropriate for individuals generically? Uh, part and parcel of the modern project is to say that people are rational and they have their own senses and so they need to be taught 
how to look at the world, how to use their uh, and develop their rational capacity to sort out competing hypotheses and to be open to debate and discussion. Uh, and if we're going to not have a feudal system, if we're going to have some sort of democratic Republican system or in the early modern world, those kinds of political systems are being revived. Well, we have to have large numbers of the citizenry who can read, who know some history, who know what's uh, know geography, so they know the different parts of the world. They need to, uh, to have some math so they can start their own businesses. They need to know how to discuss and argue so that they can get into all of these complicated political debates so that by the time they vote, they can vote in an informed way and so on. So it's in all of that context, early science, early democratic republicanism, there's a huge dose, of course, of religious toleration that's going to be necessary. Mm. It's People a liberal have, ethic, right? It's, it's, exactly, it's what I'm exactly picking up right. here. It's, so it's the whole liberal freedom, ethic it's freedom. part of a broader liberal philosophy. How do we train people so that they can take on this uh, living freely in a complicated, open-ended open -ended world? And so liberal education with its emphasis on broad-based education, you need to know a lot about a lot of things. And it's also not got to be not only theoretical, but it also needs to be applied so you can actually take the knowledge and use it in your life. You know, knowledge is power, like Bacon said, that you are respectful of other people's uh, uh, own judgments and that they're going to go off on different paths in their own life. And uh, then having a whole civil discourse ethic in place and so on. So then you, it's only on the basis though of that very broad philosophy that you get a specific liberal arts education ideal coming into being. Now then what happens though, of course, is that the postmoderns, they're well aware of what liberal education is all about. You know, it says professors are supposed to present both sides or all sides of an argument, particularly on the controversial issues, uh, and that they, uh, you know, they should have faculty who are diverse in their outlooks so that students get exposed to all of the viewpoints and that ultimately you're not trying to indoctrinate students. You might have things that you profess as a professor, but only once the student is up to speed on what the issues are and what the arguments are, then you jump in. And, but, and in the final analysis, you leave it up to the students to make up their own minds and you respect those students who make good arguments for positions that you disagree with. So the postmoderns are very well aware of that entire liberal philosophy, modern enlightenment and the education system. And uh, so in people like Freire and Giroux and Bell Hooks and the others, they are explicitly piece by piece going through all elements of that, undercutting them and then asking what is going to be the postmodern replacement for that. And you end up with a an opposite kind of education system. This this looks to me like it's if you're in the control room of Western civilization, you're just pulling out the wire the wires on the navigation system yeah. like this, and and so it's 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 I don't know, the more of this I read, I feel like going in the streets and just yelling, "Hey guys, there's a, there's a revolution afoot!" And then people, you you start saying that to people, and they're like, "You're a madman, an absolute yes. madman." Yeah, that's right. Um, it's very, it's very difficult because there's something, there's something inherently m morally dubious about that. Unless you believe what they believe, um, there's this always, I mean, we could probably pivot into the religious aspects of it here, but there's this kind of Gnostic special knowledge um, mm. aspect there to it. That. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so there's this discourses thing where um, they believe that the world in its in its default form is is races and sexes and so much so that the discourses and the knowledge and the way we speak about things are in are, are oppressing marginalized groups um true to some small degree not to the degree <laughs> that they're yeah. taking it to and it's so also keeping them and giving them a false consciousness and this is the gnostic element that you have yeah. so the false consciousness is widespread due to mass capitalistic media but then only the specially trained critical theorists, that's you and me, right? The special guys, right? We can rip off the veil or rip off the masks to use Foucauldian metaphors to see what's really going on underneath. So I'll be just, I, I can't emphasize this enough. This is not useful, but just get rid of it. It's, it is not possible to avoid being socialized into a racist worldview if you're white. It, it's not possible. It's coming at us 24-7. The only way to resist it is to be able to see it. 
and think it through. So to deny it is not going to help you. Right? I think that the key props or supports uh, that keep racism unabated today are uh, colorblindness or celebrate diversity narratives. Those are the two versions of the doc that I showed you. Uh, individualism, this emphasis on ourselves as individuals and that we can be exempt from all of this conditioning and socialization. Even as I do these talks, oftentimes people get their backs up just in the fact that I'm generalizing and that's like a very sacred ideology, right? You can't generalize. Well, actually, as a sociologist, I can. <laughs> yeah, the critical theory uh, becomes absolutely important as it's called here. And critical theory has the, its the elitism. The elitism as well oh. is is oh. so sorry. So the elitism is built into that because I think I just I like to draw it into everyday people's experience, and they're very much experiencing this kind of clergy of people telling them what to do. So the first person experience of this is some kind of elite class telling you that you're morally wrong, right? And, every, and that's the thing that people are feeling on the street. But it's right. it's all philosophically. It's all there. Right. Sure. So you, uh, you know, all of the standard accusations, right? You're a racist or a sexist or a, or a homophobe or whatever it is. And the person says, what? Um, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And then... Uh, or, or, or even worse, I hope not. What am I doing wrong? Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, uh, uh, and then there's just the false consciousness. And then we start looking for, you know, microaggressions, but it's only the specially trained person who who uh, knows how to spot what the microaggression is and how properly to interpret it and, and so on. So there's a certain amount of uh, uh, Freudian psychoanalysis mm. that got imported by mm. the Frankfurt School people. So they were wanting to argue you know, that kind of external political and economic oppression was not enough to yeah. explain what was going on, that somehow the Westernism it was so imperialistic that it gets inside people's psyche and gives them uh, verbal formulations that they use on themselves to then repress and drive subconsciously or into their unconscious uh, things that they are not aware of. So they will deny overt racism or subtle racism or any sort of uh, awareness of their own oppression. So then it really takes the critical theorists to get inside the heads of people who are not only oppressed but also repressed and they're doing it to themselves to uh, yes. re-educate them. Now these consequences are often invisible to the naked eye and the naked eye is the eye that's not accustomed to looking at issues through an intersectional prism. There is however a solution, a practice that can heighten our capacity to see the limitations of a non-intersectional feminism or a non-intersectional racism. And here we are, here we are to save you from your racism and sexism. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Your, so your unconscious racism, right, or, or sexism. And in a way, uh, uh, there's a theoretical argument that gets developed here. Marx has a ver an early version of this. Um, and uh, there are other theorists in the, in the early part of the 20th century who have versions of it as well. But the critical theorists are, are making, it, uh, making it explicit. My view though is, uh, 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 you know, aside from the philosophical issues, that the, the fact that they were so focused, uh, or at least not we, some of us are so focused on trying to find microaggressions and the, the tiniest hints of something, that, that is in fact a, a sign of great health in our culture, you know, that we have succeeded mm -hmm and get, getting rid of the, the macro aggressions, so to speak, and all of the over yeah, 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 and racism. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, you know, if, if you are really resorting to getting out the microscope to try to find some residual elements of racism and sexism, well, that means we've come a long way. So we should pat well, ourselves. There's, there's, some, there's some interesting element to this where it's, we, got, we came so far that all the low hanging fruit had gone. It's like they're all their heroes are, are people, you know, Mandela or, or Martin Luther King who had, or the suffragettes who had a really, who had a mission. Sure. Right? And so they deserve, they deserve to yeah. go into the streets and they're yeah. heroes, they're heroes, yeah. they're heroes. Um, and so if you get to a point where, where all the low hanging fruit's gone and you can't mark, you can't run into the streets and, and, um, 
yeah. and get that get that kind of this the social adoration that all their heroes had how do you do that it has to take on some kind of uh spiritual um um aspect to it it has to move away mm-hmm. from reality in some sense and i think that the 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 postmodern enterprise you sprinkle postmodernism onto onto our current day and then all of a sudden you're swept up into this cosmic battle between good and evil mm-hmm. well there are some you know deep philosophical theories and psychological sociological theories behind you know critical theory and postmodernism and so on but i think uh, the further we get into it we're now second and third generation yeah, a lot of it i think is uh, just uh, can be explained by easy careerism. So if you are, uh, you know, a second or third rate mind, and there are lots of them in in academic world. You know, you're just a good student. You showed up. You turned in your papers, and you got your PhD, and you get a nice job as a as a professor. Uh, but you're not really a, a first rate person, and you know. But nonetheless, you want to have the sense that you are making a difference. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, some of the very easy causes to get behind. I mean, it's not that hard to be anti-racist or it's not mm. that hard to be anti-sexist and to, to show that you care about the poor. So if you have a ready-made vocabulary and a whole cause available to you, and it seems to have some cultural cachet, mm. well, you can make a career out of that. And you can get some notoriety out of that without being uh, particularly you can also convince yourself of it right if you read sure. this stuff there's a, there's a type of derangement that goes on well, um, that. Enough to have your own. we shouldn't well, yes. talk about the 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 motivations of the people but i think there's this different kinds there are, there are there are cynical people just careerists and then there are people who genuinely believe it people who are halfway who are kind of convincing themselves that it's true right. and, and maybe have a little bit of cognitive dissonance. And yeah, well, that is a huge occupational hazard. We know there are any number of true believers and people can genuinely talk themselves into just about anything. And if you're a, a, a smart person, uh, you also have the reinforcer. You know that you're smarter than the average person, so you're more likely to trust your own mind. Mm. And there are lots of uh, uh, philosophical and psychological positions that you know, initially can be very appealing and there are good arguments that can be made, but to the extent that you're intelligent, you follow them down the rabbit hole and you think you're being honest, but you do end up in a very weird place, right? Because of some subtle mistake in that initially appealing you know, position. Mm. So, mm. Yeah, that's another variant as well. But it's, all, it's also the, de- the degrading of the quality. Um, it, it's quite obvious um, from what I've seen, the further you go back, the, the, the more solid it, it becomes. Yes. Um, yes and sure, I, yeah. I would think that that's, I would say that that's built in. See, this is why I love, I love your initial comment because it's kind of, uh, there's a predictive element to philosophy that I'm, I'm starting to realize and enjoy because it's built into the philosophy that it would degrade because if you're not optimizing for truth, Right. Like if, if you're if you don't necessarily believe that we can achieve truth, then you would try very hard. You wouldn't. Yeah. You're not. Why would you try? And so all of a sudden it's this. This is this is a big change. And this is fundamentally what um, most regions and pluckers have been looking at. It very much happened in the late 80s through the 90s where you have this clear we were calling it applied postmodernism. But it's this clear, um, we're not optimizing for truth, we're optimizing for change. We're mm-hmm. optimizing, they're optimizing for something else. Huh. And so it was open for the hoax project, the dog park paper. Uh, for, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. It's like, it's so oh. ridiculous. How would anyone end up there? <laughs> the author fairly uncritically <laughs> tags a number of one every hour <laughs> sexual encounters. <laughs> between dogs as rape without providing a strong basis for the researcher's knowledge of whether these encounters were wanted or unwanted. The author (laughs) defines consensual dog sex as when the penetration was not resisted. (laughs) But what are the author's credentials for for assessing dog behavior to this extent? (laughs) That's that's what this paper was about. Just train men like we train dogs. It is also not politically feasible to leash men, yank their leashes when they misbehave, or strike men with leashes or other objects in an attempt to help them desist from sexual aggression and other predatory behaviors. 
It's not politically feasible. It's not politically feasible. <laughs> Oh, it makes sense, right? Yeah, the debasement is, uh, is, as you put it, predictive in the general principle, because yeah, yeah, the idea that the seeking for truth as a regulative ideal in your thinking, yeah, that high aspiration, uh, means that when you are a younger person and you are training, uh, you're going to set your standards very high, and you're going to train your critical faculties in a certain direction. And you're going to uh, learn how to spot contradictions and be careful about evidence and probabilistic claims and different ways of framing partial evidence and so on. But once the truth as a regulative ideal goes out the window, then all of those logical, definitional, careful attention to, uh, to, to observation and so on, those go out the window. But on the normative side, and there's a, there's a strong connection there as well, you know, once you start uh, you make a commitment to you know individuals aren't autonomous agents right with any locus of self-control and self-responsibility you make the shift and you see people as avatars for various sorts of group identities or there are just these sh shifting col collectives in collision with each other mm -hmm. once you go down that road then there's going to then be another kind of debasement you're not going to treat other individuals right with respect Mm. Uh, or, 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 or be willing to tolerate argumentation and differences of opinion and challenges to your own viewpoint, or the idea that through discussion uh, we can sort out what's the best compromise or the best principle together. Again, all of those civil ethical skills will be suffering mm. debate as well. Uh, so both on the cognitive side and the normative side, we... Uh, we go down the road. This is, we're in a very, we're very much in the late eighties, early nineties, when it moves into a normative, it's a moral enterprise. And this is where I, I would argue it becomes some kind of religious entity. Mm. Um, it's it's, it's a moral bit intuition. You take to be the, the religious markers. What are the religious markers? Yeah. <laughs> everywhere, everywhere. So this started, this started. Abstractly, what do, what do you mean by religious here? Is it that it's a, an article of faith? Or that oh, it's, uh, probably, it's, a, I'd say Durkheimian, a Durkheimian. But it's just taken for granted. Um, or there's a, kind of an eschatological end state that you're striving for. Uh, what what are you picking up it's, on? It is, it is all fair. And so I've, I've got a lot of thoughts around this, but it's mainly from a Durkheimian perspective, um, where it's a moral community. And I'm sorry, uh, after D Durkheim, you broke up for a few seconds. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Um, so Durkheimian perspective, these, this is this is a this is a, a moral community. Um, and so I mean, his his most basic description of a religion. And this is where I'm I'm coming from, is um, beliefs and practices in relation to a sacred, which is something that's set apart um, and set apart from the profane. Um, what I think has taken place, and I might might be a madman here, but I think that there's some there's something to it, which is what has been made sacred in the late '80s into the early '90s was. Um, Oppression based on identity, which in some loose humanist perspective is suffering to them. It's the only suffering worth looking at for some reason. Mm -hmm. But that is sacred. And so all the scholarship is circling around the sacred victim. And it's, it's, a, it's a set of beliefs and practices. It's re the reams and reams. We're talking 20 years of just beliefs and practices and rules sure. um, in, in order to, to stay away from this sacred oppression yeah. based on identity which in my mind is is suffering i think that the, they've they've done the Jack, james and i laugh about it but it's kind of I'm, I'm oppressed therefore i am they've got rid of everything except for that and then circled around that and i know this i know this is a strange way of looking at it but that's i think that that's a it's 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 it's, it's a tool i'm using to understand what the hell is going on there right. so if the words make sense it's a secular religion you don't have spiritual beings you don't have a, a robust metaphysics but you do have all of the the normative patterns playing themselves out 
Well, the, I can I could probably the, start chipping. I could probably start chipping the kind away of at that. Yeah, the the sympathy for the the meek uh, who hopefully will inherit the earth. Uh, the, the the great Satan is the the rich and the powerful. Wow. So, yeah, there's lots of lots of uh, lots of traction you can get there. There's also a metaphysic. <laughs> I'm starting to see there's a metaphysic of discourse, which mm. is which is. Um, and it, it, it works in, in a big container of humanism. And so it's, it, is, it is the discourses are moving through people and you can change the world, word, uh, world by suppressing certain speech. Yeah. And so it's this, it's this, and you don't have an act of God anymore. It's all in this humanist kind of materialist worldview. So I think they're fitting into our culture so well and recruiting people really well because they're operating within this, this kind of moral paradigm that we're all in but they have a very strange reading of the text it's kind of like a sect yeah well i would i would suggest a different framing uh the idea of remediating suffering uh eliminating oppression um uh, that's got a long history right and there's nothing uniquely postmodern about that so i think that goes back uh, particularly in the modern form but with a positive emphasis uh, you know, to people like Francis Bacon and John Locke, where they say we, we want to remediate human suffering, uh, but rather than you know, just remo removing enough suffering so that life is tolerable, we can, in fact, improve the human condition. We can make progress. We can uh, set the pursuit of happiness as a realistic goal. So that emphasis on the positive uh, as well as solving the problems and eliminating all of the oppressions of the past. That's very deep in the, the DNA of, of modernism. And so I think if you want to use a humanist label, that makes sense. That rather than saying that God will save us or that we should be suffering because God wants us to punish us for our sins, the original humanist move is then to say, we are in charge of our destinies. We have the tools and the power to improve the human condition. Now, I think postmodernism, though, is a new kind of anti-humanist movement uh, more fundamentally. So here, uh, you know, all of the pointing back in philosophy, I think, becomes important. So, the, you know, the second and third generation people you're talking about, they point back, say, to Foucault and Lyotard and so forth. Uh, and, and Rorty, and all of them are, as you would, uh, your formulation is right, they're focusing on remediation of suffering. But uh, you know, when you see who they're pointing back to, it's someone like Martin Heidegger, who is very much anti-humanist, right, fundamentally, and Friedrich Nietzsche, and Karl Marx, and Hegel. And what you find all of them, of course, is they're interested in power and how power works, but one common theme running through all of them is the, is the exact opposite. It's not that. Humans are the frame and discourse or whatever form of power is something mm. that we use. Mm. They are de-emphasizing the human. Human mm. beings are something through which a force beyond themselves or underlying them works. It constitutes them and it uses them for their purposes. So Hegel you know, has some sort of providential power force working through using evil. Mm. Yeah, using human beings and discarding them as it works its purpose out for marx we're born as kind of lumps of plasticine and there are underlying economic forces that constitute us and use us for our purposes for nietzsche you know uh, it's the will to power power is that fundamental substratum and it constitutes us and uses us for its of some sort of evolutionary purposes and uh, you get a variation on that in heidegger so someone like foucault i think is very perceptive on this you know, he will say you know i read a lot of heidegger uh and i read a lot of nietzsche and basically i am a nietzschean right on this on this point so uh i i take your point about the humanism that the focus is on and i think this is the attraction of postmodernism to many people before they See, get educated we care about your suffering and the, the, and, and the people who are still being uh, uh, oppressed. And that's a humanistic impulse, but the whole rest of the philosophy is anti-humanistic and using that as a hook. 
So I guess the hook, I love that you said that because that, that's, I think that's the point. That's what I was trying to achieve with the, with the big frame, little frame, because there is this, this strange question that um, how could something so strange and so actually fundamentally different be getting so much traction? Yeah. Like the human is part of it seems to me like some kind of Trojan horse because um, mo- everyone's experiencing a version of this, but Carol in HR hasn't read Foucault you know what I mean? But she, she's going, she's picking it all up. And I'm like, well, how, how is that actually happening? And so it has to be that it's masquerading as some kind of humanism. Like, I think that you, you were spot on when you say that's, that's the hook. And that's, I guess that's what I'm trying to achieve with that, with that formulation. It's not quite, quite but right. you, you understand what I'm saying, right? Right. Yeah. And there's also you know, a natural benevolence that we all have, you know, partly this is a cultural achievement that we have it as strongly as we do. That for centuries now, those of us in the modern world, we've learned that there is oppression, there are bad people, there are victims, uh, but we're very optimistic about thinking we should be able to solve all of those problems and eliminate all of the, all of the oppression. And it matters to us uh, that we do so. And we're optimistic enough, again, this is a modern inheritance, to think that we should be able to make progress in all of these social dimensions. So someone who comes along with a cause and says, here is a victim group. We're very sensitized Mm -hmm. to that. And we're willing to give that person the benefit of the doubt. And if the person then takes that benefit of the doubt and our natural benevolence and then starts to turn it against us, well, we're already, we've let them in the door. And then they've got the sophisticated ideological apparatus to know what to do with that. And it's, it's strong as hell. I guess, it, I guess it's scary as well. Like to go back to, I liked before when you were, when you were adding the, if you understand these frameworks, then there's a predictive element to it. And the thing that worries me is that if you press play on this, this ideology, um, war is built in some kind, some kind of, some kind of just all out battle. I, uh, between groups. Again, I can't. Go, back, uh, go back to the philosophers. Uh, for Hegel, it is conflict and oppression that moves the forces of history forward. In Marxism, it is, there's the necessity of violent revolution to take mm-hmm. the class struggle to the next stage. In, uh, in, uh, in Nietzsche, it's explicit conflict, exploitation, <laughs> power, uh, the strong dominating the weak are necessary to move forward. So, so absolutely, war is built into it. Uh, and I think that, again, is in contrast to the whole tendency of the modern liberal ethos, because there the argument has been, since we are rational beings, if we can get enough people educated and rational, and we can respect people as individuals, then we can develop all sorts of trading institutions uh, that bring us together. We want to trade rather than make war. Uh, and so, you know, the, the nations that became commercial republics stopped going to war against each other in the modern world, shocking. The idea of religious toleration, uh, you know, developing institutions in scientific method of being uh, open to debate and discussion. You know, let our theories go to war in a, in a peaceful yeah. thing and uh, rather than having to fight it on the streets and so yeah. on. So the, the whole movement toward peace, toleration, and, and progressive conflict resolution, that's the modern liberal ethos. That's explicitly under attack for philosophical reasons by the postmoderns. The interesting thing, I, I, I want to get your thoughts on this, because I realize that we're bumping up against an hour, but uh, yeah, there, we are. There, is this, there is this way in which you make, they make it true right? So if, if you believe that power is fundamental and, and the world is some kind of power battle, um, if, if you then take that on as gospel and you believe that, then you will start behaving in that way. And then other people will start behaving that way toward you because you're behaving in that way. All of a sudden, you're surrounded in the, in the world that you bought into. And so the more people you teach about this, the more that, yeah, that it's a, becomes, it becomes true. Yeah, it's a, it's a self-creating reality. ESI Creates has been an amazing opportunity for our school to have time dedicated to come together to talk about how do we create anti-racist schools. Our number one goal was to close the achievement gap. And for 10 years, we did this by focusing just on academics. 
And we realized that is not enough and that we really need to rethink our curriculum and rethink the culture of our school to be culturally responsive and to be actively anti-racist. I see teaching as a very political act. When we are engaging with our students, whether it's on social justice issues or multicultural issues or culturally relevant teaching, I see that as foundational to all learning. We are learning a lot about like different issues in this world and like um, what's happening around like we're mostly thinking about like racial and culture in my class and how we could change the future. We have all of these different people that are activists. We have um, gay people, we have transgender people, and we have people that are taking action. And we're learning how to take action in social studies now. In my school, we can read books about people that has brown skin. We've seen our students become empowered. We've seen them see that even at the age of four that they can take an active role and be activists. And so it's through this work that we realize that education without this conversation isn't going to make a difference for our children. There are all these ugly things built into this philosophy, so it's, it's hard for me to be optimistic when I see it in so many places. Yeah. Well, I, I am optimistic, but I take your point that it's hard to be optimistic. And when you surround yourself with the readings and you go into that world, you know, it fills your consciousness. And so all you see yeah. is the it's right, so to speak. But there are uh, you know, positive trends. You know, the fact that we are now, for the last five years, talking seriously and overtly about postmodernism, those kinds of conversations were not happening 10 years ago or 15 years ago. So there's at least awareness and there's significant pushback by a significant number of smart people. So Steven Pinker and Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Haidt and others are first-rate people, and they're all standing up from different parts of the political spectrum and saying, this is a problem. And you know, that's, a, that's a good sign. I think uh, um, you know, students are not stupid. I think uh, particularly those who go to university and they want to make something of their lives, uh, those students typically don't follow postmodernism very far. They go into classes and they're saying, you know, I, I'm not really interested in a whole semester of being told that I'm a bad person because of the color of my skin or my gender or whatever. I want to do something. So, uh, I think there's only disaffected people who, by and large, are significantly attracted to postmodernism mm -hmm. in integration. Um, and I think uh, it's also interesting that as globalization has occurred, wealth is rising around the world, and uh, there are all sorts of people who are very realistic coming from poorer countries. And they want to make something of their lives and be prosperous and they're not going to buy into everything's just a social construct and, and so forth. It seems to be more of a disease of the, the rich Western, mm. uh, it's, it's a first world problem if we, if we put it a in lot, that. A lot, there's a lot in India and actually my, my, I, I want to look into this with my dad's country, yeah. which is an African uh, island, Mauritius. Um, I think a lot of the post-colonial stuff moved into there via the, the sure. oh, uh, yeah. Indi Indian population. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's there and it's a, it's a way to capture some, some form of power in those countries. Uh, uh, you know, I think human beings, particularly younger people, they want to do something significant with their life. Uh, there's a lot of wealth. There's a lot of opportunity. We now have the tools. Yes, institutions can be co-opted. But we, we also are very good entrepreneurially at building new infrastructures. Uh, and making a go of them. You know, it's just the fact that Facebook and Amazon didn't exist 20 years ago, and neither did Google or whatever, you know, 30 years ago now, I suppose it is. Uh, we can do that again. You know, the bricks and mortar matter, but also, you know, we're also very good at building new bricks and mortar institutions. So the fact that smart people are turning on postmodernism and trying to develop alternatives and attack it, the rising generation, they want to do something with their lives. And the fact we have lots of tools, uh, I don't think we should give up. I think we should be optimistic. Good. There's a kind of uh, relaxed, relaxed wisdom there that I'm going to try and embody. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck with your uh, film project and the grievance studies work that you're doing with uh, Bogosian and Lindsay. That's, that's important stuff. Thanks, mate. It was really good to speak to you. All right. Bye for now. Yeah.
But as the violence escalated, some of the terrorist leaders began to have doubts. In trying to expose Germany's hidden past, they had unearthed something far more complex and far more sinister than they had bargained for. I had begun to realize that uh, fighting against the state by armed groups with this uh, revolutionary strategy in, in mind was uh, bringing up uh, fascistic tendence, tendencies in the reaction not only uh, of the political class, but in the people too. We ourselves became in the same way fascistic as the fascists were. We didn't realize that our enemies, our opponents, are human beings. This is what is in the heart fascism, the oppression of other meanings of the political opposition, and uh, oppression means elimination. We understood something. We understood that fascism is a component in all of us.